Great. So thank you all for uh, joining us for this next session. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard from the University of Georgia, and I will be moderating the session. The session is entitled uh, Risk Communication in Multi-Hazard Environments, Challenges, and Learning Opportunities from Compounding Hazards and Cascading Impacts. Uh, we have four key or high-level goals that we would like to address in this particular session. One is how do we define compound and cascading hazards? I've been involved in another academy's effort and that's been quite a discussion over the last several months. Highlighting the dynamic changes in vulnerability to infrastructure and at-risk communities with respect to recent events such as Harvey, Laura, or Michael. Uh, characterizing unique challenges with risk communication associated with such events. And then finally, present opportunities to advance risk communication from the perspective of compound and cascading hazards. Uh, we have a very uh, important and exciting and engaged panel. Uh, it consists of Jen Henderson, Jason Sinkbile, Rebecca Moulton, Jeff Linder, and Jessica Schauer. Most of our panelists are actually virtual today. So shout out to Jason, who I see is, I think that's Jason holding it down there at the table. Uh, but before we get into the broader panel discussion, I'd like to uh, share the virtual mic and pass it along to Jen Henderson from Texas Tech University, who is our invited speaker for this session. So Jen, if you wouldn't mind um, just uh, taking the mic and, and introducing yourself and then uh, telling us uh, what you have to say. Thank you. Are you all able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna start my presentation here virtual. Are you able to see my screen? We are not. Let me try again. How's that? That's good. Yep, there we go. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity um, to, to talk to you all today. Um, I've just enjoyed the conversation so much so far, and think there's so much to, to already be um, discussing that were raised by the first two panels. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Texas Tech University, and I've been studying compound hazards for probably the last decade or so. And I'm really excited to share with you a lot of what I've learned from other, um, from other people that I've been working with and can see them listed here on the screen. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about what Marshall just mentioned with definitions and also introduce um, some problems around classification and its consequences. And I wanted to start off by um, introducing just a few quotes that I think nicely suggest the kind of challenges that we can have when we think about definitions and classification in general. Um, in part, the way we understand and describe risk strongly influences the way risk is analyzed, and hence, it may have serious implications for risk management, governance, and decision making. And I think this is important to keep in mind that the definitions and the classifications and the way we talk about risk is not benign, that it has consequences that are material. And um, another quote that I really like by Bowker and Starr asks specifically about classification but what are these categories and who makes them and who may change them? When and where do they become visible and how do they spread? Remarkably for such a central part of our lives, we stand for the most part in formal ignorance of the social and moral order created by these invisible potent entities. And I think this really raises the stakes for us in thinking about how these conversations can shape the way that um, the social is created, um, the social order, but also sort of the ethical and moral obligations that we have around these discussions. And so I wanted to introduce um, a, a few concepts that I, I think with um, in relationship to these quotes. And the first one is the notion of extremes, which already has been discussed here today. And there are so many different definitions and ways of thinking about extremes, of course, and you can see them listed here. But what is really important, of course, is that uh, extremes are increasing given uncertainties of climate change. And that's been referenced seven, several times already. So what are our ideas, understanding of extremes is um, a moving target. And one of the ways that we think about extremes is through these billion dollar hazards. And in 1980, NOAA started tracking these billion dollar hazards and I couldn't find exactly why billion dollars was the mark. Um, but each year there are several, um, several dozen in case, in some cases, um, extremes. 
measured by billion dollar events. Um, you can see just the last three or four years here, there have been you know nearly 20, and last year, 28 extremes that were measured by these billion dollar metrics. And something to think about here is that, you know, we we use language like historic and unprecedented and record with these descriptions, which seem to suggest that every year there are more and more extremes or there are extremes that we've never seen before. And in fact, since 1980, um, the total cost of these events has exceeded $2.6 trillion. So we're talking about a lot of money, a lot of lives, um, and a lot of metrics here. But there could be other metrics that we think about, the half billion dollars, the quarter billion dollars that are significant to the population, depending on who we're, we're looking at and what context it is. So billion dollars is one way of thinking about extremes. Another way of thinking about extremes is, um, you know, number of hurricanes over the past several decades in terms of intensity, cost, and death. And again, the National Hurricane Center, part of NOAA, um, has a, a link there that provides a really nice database of storms up to 2010 that are really significant um, and extreme in many different ways. And this is just a sampling of them. Some of them we'll talk about throughout this workshop, but again, just noting how many of them there are in it. The database goes back even into the 1800s. So extremes have been with us for a long time. They're getting more and more frequent. Um, we can measure them in different ways. But I think the great question to ask ourselves is what Dr. Cutter did in 2014. What makes events extreme? And when do extreme events transcend and become routine or everyday occurrences? And I think we're on the cusp of that latter question. Are extremes the new normal? And what does that mean if extremes are the new normal? So I think there's a couple of opportunities here. Um, how do we approach multi-hazard events differently if we reframe extremes as the new normal? It's just the everyday now. And another question I think is helpful is what analogs of other extremes might help us re the problem and the scales and the way forward? I wanted to offer an example here of pollution. A colleague of mine, Max Liberon, thinks about pollution as a, a you know kind of background noise now. Pollution is everywhere. It's in breast milk, it's in our blood, it's in our food, it's in the air, it's in our water, so it's ubiquitous. And so she contends that it's a permanently polluted world, um, which is one that because of its deep alteration, reclaims the need to incite new forms of response ability. Not only the responses to the world, but the ability to respond and the ethics of that. And so taking a, a cue from her, um, what would happen if we conceptualized a permanently multi-hazard world with a new normal of extreme events, one that maybe necessitates new forms of ethics and response from us as well? So in this permanently multi-hazard world, how do we think about what this means in practice? And I just wanted to highlight that I thought in the first panels, I captured as much as I could, but there are some really great ideas for what this means in terms of responsibility going forward. Um, everything from you know, the risk communication itself to the types of research that we conduct. So I think we're on a good track in answering some of these questions, but there's a lot more to say, especially around the definitions and classifications. So I wanted to highlight another problem. So the first is extreme as a new normal. The second is classification. And going back to extremes for just a moment, we classify these as multi-hazard cascading impacts. Um, we think of them as compound events where, you know, and sometimes they're compound cascading events. They can be both where the triggers and interconnections can create more magnified emergencies and they can co-occur in time and space. We have all these different dimensions to think of, not just the physical, but the social and the technical. And then we have connected extreme weather events with climate extremes, how to think about the intersections of those, and then complex extremes, the climate change uncertainties and what that means for new categories of multi-hazard events or extremes and how that might change over time. And so as Marshall alluded to, we have so many different definitions of these terms, cascading disasters, you know, the progression over time that generate unexpected secondary impacts, um, the top event arises from a series of connected errors or failures, and it creates conditions for a greater malfunction and more devastating consequences. And one um, author even suggests that in a modern networked world, most disasters will, to a greater or lesser extent, be cascading crises. So now we have extremes that are ubiquitous, but also cascades that are becoming more ubiquitous. And there's a lot of different ways to think about these cascades and then compounds, even um, typologies that are out there that are useful, perhaps to think with and conceptual models. So I just raise a few examples of the many ways that these are being talked about. They raise challenges. Um, I'll echo Cutter here in 2018 that there's little integrative science work on cascading impacts of disasters and how they become structural impediments for future disaster risk reduction. 
Um, she also mentions the social cascades that are becoming really important in a new way of thinking about cascades because the majority of work done on cascades and compounds tends to focus on physical drivers um, rather than social. And um, another uh, set of authors talks about, you know, the need for developing scenarios for cascading failures and complex events so that we can plan for them. And I wanted to briefly highlight a couple of other ways that aren't commonly talked about in the research world about thinking about these um, cascading impacts, which are wonderful journalism, like um, what's done by the Atlantic flood lines, which is about Hurricane Katrina. If you haven't listened to this, it's an amazing um, tracing of all of these different complex factors. Uh, Zytoon by David Eggers is a fictionalized nonfiction account, which is also really wonderful. And then of course, um, most recently, Kai Erickson and Lori Peake released The Continuing Storm, which traces these lessons from Katrina. So we can look at other types of medium um, media for um, answers to these questions. There's less that I could find really important about compounds that didn't repeat a lot of the cascading um, literature, but a combination of multiple drivers and hazards that contributes to societal environmental risk. And, but there's a similar claim that, that these compounds are responsible for many of the most severe related, uh, weather related and climate related impacts. And there are conceptual models of this um, where people are trying to create typologies and understand compound hazards. But again, many of these are the physical infrastructures. And I wanted to shift just for a moment to talk about um, the particular case study that I think with for compounds and cascades, and it's called TORS, which is tornado and flash floods. And perhaps this gives just a concrete example of how complex this space can be. But tornado warnings and flash floodings that flash flood warnings that overlap and um, they're characterized by 30 minutes of overlap. And then when they occur in the same time, in the same place, they can give conflicting information to people on what to do. So you see the arrow there pointing to town B. And these are fairly common across the US. These are just those 30 minute overlaps um, distributed across the US um, by month to show you that there's nearly 400 of them a year. So many people are getting potentially conflicting information or at least information they're not sure what to do with about these two hazards. And it becomes more complex in landfall and tropical cyclone context because you have different time scales and different spatial scales. You have multiple wind and water threats, not just tornadoes, but now you have synoptic winds, you have um, storm surge, and the scale of these overlaps vary in time and the timing of these events evolve and it can give contradictory advice as well. And you can see here, Hurricane Harvey sort of brought this to some national attention, though it's been ongoing for, I'm sure, years. And you can see here the National Weather Service highlighting their challenges with communicating to the public about these compound hazards when people were primarily um, on their roofs. Uh, they were sheltering from floods and then they were getting tornado water, uh, tornado warnings, excuse me. And so the question is then what do they do? How do they act? What should they do to shelter? And the National Weather Service was sort of looking to the research community like, what do we say? And this is again, happened in other hurricanes like Hurricane Ida and other kinds of questions that, that emerged there is not only looking at landfall, which I think has been discussed, but also the remnants of these storms. What's happening is these storms move across the US and we're now incorporating multiple agencies, the Storm Prediction Center, the Weather Prediction Center, the National Hurricane Center, local forecast offices, multiple scales and temporal scales and evolving threats. It gets very messy. And so what we've learned for some of this research is that the public tends to be very aware of these various threats. Um, they may experience a higher tornado risk perception and flood perception. Um, these dominant hazards in past hurricanes as proxies for understanding current and future hurricanes. Um, there's a lot of information on social media um, as helpful to them and making sense of that space and that their preparedness can evolve as well, that it's not static. And of course, multiple languages and cultural contexts are needed because there's a dearth of um, information in multiple languages. In the National Weather Service context, there's policies about flood and tornado hazards that can un unintentionally magnify one hazard. Um, they can silo their practices and expertise based on kind of legacies of how offices are set up. Um, they have the flexibility to change some of these um, policies in real time, which is great. We heard some of that in the panels this morning. Um, there are also some concerns about wind information overshadowing flood risks and hurricanes due to things like the Zaffir Simpson scale. And then with broadcasters and emergency managers, we see that they rely on the National Weather Service information. And if there are amplifications and the National Weather Service, that could propagate through the system and be communicated to the public. Um, there are some studies that suggest that maybe coverage of tornadoes might overshadow some of the coverage of flooding and that they are attending to several challenges um, like the National Weather Service, including non-weather concerns like COVID. And they're also in need of multi-language ability and um, to communicate hazards. And I know that Joseph Trujillo-Falcon is on the 
Colin will be talking about this shortly. So we see that current warnings don't often help people prioritize wind and water threats. We have language translation and cultural representation issues. And then very real are the critical incident stresses that people feel um, in these communities, especially the experts who are under tremendous strain and repeated events over time and must manage complex communication as threats evolve and intensify. So there's just so much we don't know, and I won't go through this list, it could go on and on, but there's just a lot we don't know about these spaces. And this is just one case study of one type of compound hazard. Um, there's many others. So to end, I'll return to the classification and its challenges and how this relates to this particular case study. I think this quote is really important because it highlights that the traditional classification of natural human-made and hybrid disasters seems to be insufficient to in the face of high complexity in the present day world. So maybe we need to add to our list a way to think about classification as potentially a problem. Um, in part, the problem is that classifications can give advantage and they can give suffering. Um, jobs are made or lost. Some regions benefit at the expense of others. And how these choices are made and how we think about that invisible matching process is at the core maybe of our ethical work. How does classifying our hazards even um, by you know, single hazards, how does that have cascades to, to be punny here, um, to pun through this. Um, how does that cascade through the system? Well, each of these hazards has its own epistemic culture of risk. Um, these create disciplinary knowledges that get siloed. Research agenda and funding mechanisms get formed around these particular hazards, and it makes it difficult to study um, the intersections of them or the compounding and cascading of them. And um, labs, especially in you know, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, those labs are, are formed around specific hazards and it becomes difficult then to, to work across those labs and the technologies and policies that follow from this. So we have material consequences for these classifications SEMA that are unintended. And so it can make it difficult for interdisciplinary and convergent and holistic thinking. So I think we have a couple of opportunities here um, to conceptualize and create scenarios for social cascades and compounds. Um, emphasize integrated convergent work and examine cascading impacts across different time spaces and unanticipated consequences of them. And then think more cohesively and flexibly than classification allows, or at least re-examine the things that classification hides or doesn't make visible for us. And I'll conclude here and say that I love this quote because I think it's really useful in light of the, uh, the panels where there was a highlighting of flexibility and being able to navigate and be nimble with what's happening in our world. Um, the only good classification is a living classification. So I'll end there and just say thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. That was amazing. Uh, hopefully the... Uh, audience virtually and in the room can see why we asked Jen Henderson to set the stage in context for this panel. Uh, I think we will continue to move forward in the panel and, and then synthesize all of our questions at the end. So next up, uh, and we'll have a series of five to eight minute talks from our, our next four panelists, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session after that. So uh, I'll turn it over to Jason Sinkmile from the University of Alabama. He's in the room. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jason Singville, University of Alabama. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography. So I'm a geographer, meteorologist, climatologist, depending on my audience. I guess I'm all three today. Um, and so I could talk forever about these topics, and there's already been a lot said. It was, it was really informative in the in the first session. And um, so I'm going to introduce, that was introduced then. I'm going to come back to some of that. But the two themes as far as compounding and cascading hazards and impacts. These are two themes that I think are the most important. And are we seeing more hurricanes in the tail of the distribution in the recent extremes? Well, Lee et al. published an article in Nature Communications 2023, and the number of hurricanes that have rapidly intensified within 400 kilometers of the coastline has tripled since 1980. So I'd say that's a fairly strong signal. And then getting into the, the social aspect of this, the social science, how do people perceive these recent hurricanes? And so I'll, I'll put some quotes up from some of my research in the field, but many people have a benchmark storm in that area. And this is certainly true for my family on the Alabama coast. And I've been through a lot of hurricanes and I go into most of them on purpose um, to do research and to also see the storm. But they, we have a benchmark storm and, and that's the ceiling. Like it could never possibly be stronger than that storm because that one lives on in folklore sometimes. And 
So I'm going to talk about resetting the bar based on what we're seeing now and, and trying to convey that information and talk about how both these themes intersect with compounding cascading hazards and impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So I've done a lot of research on classifying storms into two types. There's water storms and there's wind storms. And then occasionally you do have a perfect balance. Um, Dorian was the, the worst case scenario and that's a slow moving category five hurricane we've never seen that in the u.s um, and let's hope that we do not but it is probably going to happen one day so that is a balance that's a hybrid that's awful um, some of these classic water storms and i've been in many of these um, normally with these you do start to see some weakening the the pressure starts to increase the wind field expands it begins to slow down and this becomes more of a rain and surge event a larger storm tends to flood a, a larger volume of water on the coastline instead of a higher peak surge right near the landfall point. And all these things are very difficult to communicate to the public. And the National Hurricane Center does a great job. The Storm Surge Division does a great job. Um, but these are these water storms, sometimes it's hard to get the message across. And some of these classic wind storms on the other side, well, you see all the Category 5s that have hit the U.S. I mean, we see Michael, we see... Uh, Camille, we see um, the Labor Day hurricane 1935, we see Andrew, and then some other some other classic ones in there that were a little bit smaller, more concentric. Uh, maybe they went through an eyewall replacement cycle or something and rapidly intensified, but those are more of the classic wind storms. Now, the influence of storm size, well, it varies between both, but the water storms do tend to be a little larger than the classic wind storms. And so, Going back to what Robbie said earlier about emphasizing the most important hazards with each hurricane. Yes, every hurricane is different. They are all unique, but many of them, the water is more important or the wind is more important. And so I'm going to talk about suggesting to emphasize that. Uh, next slide, please. So the article, hey, Jen just brought up the Atlantic too. Well, this is an article in the Atlantic two weeks ago about are we entering a gray swan climate? And I really enjoyed the article. So uh, gray swan events, they're predictable, but they're very unlikely, extremely low odds in the in the very skinny tails of the distribution. So are we entering a gray swan climate? You can look at the bottom of some of the hurricanes that I've identified as gray swan hurricanes. And I got all this data from IBTRAX. And we're looking at the intensification rate in miles per hour and millibars in the last 24 hours before landfall. And this is all what we've seen in the last seven years. And then, of course, I put Otis there at the top. Otis was mentioned this morning. I think Otis is a black swan event. That is that's a nightmare scenario that we don't want to go through of a, a rapid intensification of a tropical storm at Cat 5 in less than 24 hours. Um, and I hope we never have to, to see something like that. But you can see Harvey, Maria, Michael, Laura, Ida, Ian, all these rapidly intensified within the last 24 hours. Some, some did rapid transitions before landfall, and it caught people off guard. Um, Irma, I did a lot of research with Irma. Uh, Roxanne was talking about Irma earlier. I also did some research during the evacuation in Irma, and that was a long time frame event. And that long time frame event um, caught everybody's attention, and then it weakened, and that that got everybody's attention, and then it wasn't quite as strong. So a close call there, and we also had a close call with Dorian. Uh, so next slide, please. So some of the quotes um, and these two Michael quotes, we did that after Michael came through. I was not able to get down into Michael and interview people um, during the evacuation. Uh, but Florence and Harvey, that was during the evacuation. So Michael, this was um, an older couple and they went to bed. It was a cat three, woke up as a cat five, didn't have enough time to get their stuff together. And they were shocked. They'd never seen anything like that. And most of us in here have not gone through a category five hurricane. And I imagine I have not either. Uh, but I imagine it is incredible. It's not something anybody would want to experience. Um, so it really surprised them. The second one is from Mariana, Florida. Mariana, about 55 miles inland, straight line from Tyndall Air Force Base, where Michael came ashore. And Mariana was devastated. It's a town of about five to 10,000 people. But um, it looked like a, a high-end EF-1, low-end EF-2 tornado went through the entire town. They had wind gusts over 100 miles an hour that far inland. And it just... They'd never experienced anything like that. If storms come through there before, but it totally shocked them. So they weren't prepared for that um, at all. Uh, Florence, so I did research in Florence. I have family in Carolina Beach and um, everybody evacuated. It was a cat four and then it weakened and it was going to become more of a water storm. As I was talking about water storms just a minute ago. And and this particular guy, he just he didn't know what to do. He's more concerned about his store. And I, I told him your store is going to have about four feet of water in it. So 
I would stop worrying. There's not as much he can do. And I would get out of the area. So I did have a good conversation with him and I hope he left. Um, um, Harvey, I was on my way down into Harvey. I stopped in Houston overnight, had a conversation with the assistant manager and she was very confident that they would not see that much rainfall. And I said, I'm very confident you're going to see more rainfall than tropical storm Allison. And y'all need to be aware of that. So again, sometimes people receive the message, but sometimes because that message seems absurd because it's something that is so extreme, it may not be believed by everyone. Uh, next slide. So just some suggestions, um, trying to emphasize the greatest hazard of concern. Is this going to be more of a, a water storm or more of a wind storm? If it's a water storm, really, I mean, we do a good job of getting people out of the surge zones, but try to emphasize the, the inland flooding potential and how you have that much inland flooding, then the rivers get swollen and the rivers can't drain into the estuaries because the surge is acting like a dam and not letting the estuary estuarine water flow out to the ocean and everything starts to rise. And I've seen some extreme values at the tops of estuaries that people thought were impossible. Um, the, the new experimental NHC cone of uncertainty, I've seen the debut of that product. I think that's a step in the right direction. It has more inland impacts. Um, I was excited to see that in the news just a couple of weeks ago. And last week, I've seen a few articles about that. Um, and then again, if, if many people are using this benchmark storm, we're not going to stop human behavior. If people are going to do that, then let's use it. Is what I'm saying. So say, okay, if, if this hurricane coming in is going to be stronger than Katrina and we are 90% confident it's going to be stronger than Katrina in this example, then let's let's say it and let's try to list the different values we're going to see in these categories and then show it in our maps and our graphical products. Um, let's try to be as transparent as possible in the communication. Um, and, and that's what I would like to see going forward. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Jason, for that discussion. Uh, he, he didn't mention it in his discussion, but Jason's also really been what I consider a pioneer in developing alternative scales that try to capture all aspects of impacts to tropical cyclones. So perhaps uh, throughout the course of the next couple of days, Jason will be able to share some of that work, too, because that's one of the ways that I'm very familiar with Jason's work. I want to move on in the session. Uh, next up, we have Rebecca Moulton from FEMA, and I believe Rebecca is on virtually. Yes, I am. Um, thank you, Marshall, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, all right. So, this fine. Yep. All right, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, good afternoon from Atlanta. Um, my name is Rebecca Moulton. I'm a meteorologist with FEMA here in Region 4, which, as you'll see in um, some examples that I'm going to share with you, um, has a little bit of a different connotation, a lot like what Jason said, um, I am sort of a discipline within a discipline, really focusing on emergency managers as opposed to the public. And as I was reflecting on this um, presentation, I realized uh, I've been in the hurricane world for 20 years, and I remember vividly Hurricane Charlie. Um, back in um, 2004, and it brought back a lot of um, lessons learned and best practices, and it really made me think about what's changed, what hasn't changed, what has stayed the same, and how that has influenced, I think, not only multiple hazards, but uh, communication. And it started really with the forecast accuracy versus the perception of the public of the forecast. And we saw that a little bit again with Ian, but it's an interesting uh, kind of very fine line that is, is walked amongst all of us in the community. And it really informed going into 2005, my career going in from the perspective of a meteorologist, having the expertise in supporting evacuation messaging and going on to FEMA, I came in thinking I have all this subject matter expertise and realized I had a lot of different ways to say no to the questions I was being asked. Um, and at the time that's because we had a lot of deterministic information. Um, believe it or not, we didn't even have iPhones, uh, but we had a lot of deterministic information. And so the forecasts have evolved since then 
But the turning point for me was, again, we use Charlie a lot in our training and outreach. And the turning point for me was really uh, the opportunity to talk directly to and go out to the counties that we serve and talk to the people I worked with. And um, there was a moment when I was giving a briefing, I can't remember what storm it was, but there were people in the room were a little frustrated. And I thought, I'm doing everything right. You know, I'm saying things the right way. I'm giving the best data. But from their perspective, I wasn't answering any questions. And FEMA does not have luxury of waiting. Even waiting is an action. So after listening to some of the, the problems and contingencies that were on their plate to plan for, I, it really made me kind of flip my perspective about, first of all, who the experts are. There's been a lot of discussion today about who's accurate and inaccurate. And, you know, it's worth kind of looking into that a little deeper to, to consider who really owns that. Um, but in, from my perspective, it really helped me understand how my role was no longer the meteorologist with the important information to share. It was how can I see things from their perspective, from the emergency managers at whatever level, and let their needs inform all stages of our process from planning to the briefings operationally and during the incident response. So that was definitely a pivotal moment when suddenly, and at the same time, we have, you know, an explosion of data that's freely available to everyone. Um, whether or not they understand it is another topic, but we have all this information, but having those specific questions, criteria, understanding what decisions had to be made and what was driving that underneath it and coming from that perspective, now suddenly we are able to provide context and select the right information from all of the possible no's and, and, and to say, well, here's what we do know. And it was surprising how that actually was more than enough. Uh, we have very important life or death decisions. We have to mobilize very early. And so we can tolerate a large degree of uncertainty, which I learned during Florence. Uncertainty is virtually meaningless when it comes to actions, but meteorologists use it possibly more than any other qualifier. Um, but it helps us go from those extended timelines where we have, um, we can tolerate a lot of changes. We just have to get started doing something. And that was really a big shift for me in how I communicate. So in terms of what that means for multiple events, it's just a reminder to me that even now we have more probabilistic products. We have all of these advances in the forecast and the science. When I'm supporting emergency managers, we're all people. And really, even though the scientists in the room, the meteorologists are experts in our discipline, emergency managers are experts at what they do as well. And I really had to take off my hat of subject matter expert to see that in many ways. So I, people in general are complicated. So every single event and on any given day, emergency managers are juggling multiple events so, you know, I'll just wrap up with, um, I took a detail to uh, the White House Interagency Working Group on Extreme Heat, thinking I would get a break from some of the stress um, from hurricanes, and it ended up being more stressful. And on my very last day, my air conditioning broke and I became one of the people. So it's it just another example of Murphy's Law, but also flipping my perspective, so to speak. I'll wrap up my comments there and look forward to um, answering the questions later with our panel discussion. Thank, thank you, Rebecca, for those remarks. Um, always know that you have a bring perspectives from multiple lenses, which I think is very valuable to this uh, panel. And so thank you for participating. I wanna now pivot to Jeff Lindner, who 
really has been in the field for some time now, but I think the nation became aware of who he was with the, with the Hurricane Harvey and his out outstanding work there. So uh, we'll pass it along to Jeff Linder, who is a meteorologist with Harris County Flood Control District. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, this is really going to focus on Harvey and a lot of the, the communication we had with Harvey, but you can apply this to so many of the different um, aspects, and I'll kind of mention that as we go through that. So we can go to the next slide. So I work as as the meteorologist in Harris County. Um, I, I'm sitting with the Flood Control District, district, but I do work in the Emergency Operations Center for Harris County. Anytime we have a weather event, so it's hurricane, flood, wildfire, winter storm, all that. We get it all down here in, in Texas, like most places. And so this was the messaging that we that we were dealing with 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 Harvey. We had a category four hurricane impact on the mid coast, so we consider the mid coast down that Corpus Christi Victoria area, and then we're up here on the upper Texas coast. And we were never going to have a hurricane impact on the upper Texas coast in Houston. It was always going to be a flooding event. And you can see we kind of had to separate the two. The thing is, a lot of people heard hurricane. And when they hear the word hurricane, they think it's going to be wind. We're going to have power outages. We're going to have trees down. We're going to have roof damage. We're going to have fences blown over. All the stuff that you generally expect with the word hurricane. And the other two aspects tend to get kind of pushed to the side. The storm surge flooding and also the inland freshwater rainfall flooding that we get with a lot of these. And so we were really hammering that flood threat with this. We never, you know, used... Um, you know, hurricane warning and stuff like that. We we're never into hurricane warning up here on the upper Texas coast. We did have a little bit of storm surge, but we downplayed that. You know, we're talking about this is not going to be any worse than a, than a tropical storm when it comes to the storm surge flooding. That was different messaging down on the lower Texas coast. And then it's it's as usual with a with and this has been mentioned before with a tropical system, you have a multi-hazard threat over a geographic area, right? So, you know, the storm surge is in this area, the wind threat is in this area, the flooding threat could potentially overlap with all that or, or be outside of that area. And so it's how do you communicate these with different areas? And again, people are hearing different things. So somebody knows somebody who lives down in Victoria or Corpus Christi, and they're like, oh, well, they're telling us to evacuate from the storm surge. Oh, well, maybe I need to do that up here in Houston. And that never was really the case. We don't evacuate in Houston or in Harris County from rainfall flooding. Now, we do have storm surge evacuation here. We do have uh, zip code zones. We evacuate by zip code here. Um, kind of had that conversation earlier about people don't know what zone they're in. We have ABC also, but we overlay those with the zip codes and everybody knows their zip code for the most part. And so we have not actually had an evacuation for storm surge since Hurricane Ike back in 2008. Prior to that, it was Hurricane Rita, um, which many of you may remember was, was kind of a uh, debacle, if you will, on the evacuation side. Next slide. And so this was the forecast, and, and we just saw this a minute ago, I think, with Jason's presentation and, and what people gather from a forecast. And, and you can see I'm looking at this, and even in the blue, it's bad. You know, everybody's drawn down to that purple magenta area, 30, 40 inches of rain. But we're talking 15, 10 to 15 inches of rain, even well outside of that kind of bullseye in that blue area. That's still a very bad day. Um, and so people are ten, tend to be drawn to that maximum total, the maximum uh color scheme and all that type of stuff and it's like oh well i'm not in i'm not in that bullseye so i'll be fine right i'm, I'm only going to get a foot of rain I, we've had a foot of rain and we kind of talked about that just a minute ago the other thing is this is over five days well that's not that bad so if i take 35 inches divided by five days that gives me seven inches a day oh that's not that's not that big of a that's not that big of a problem. We can handle that. And as we all know, with tropical systems and flood situations, it's all about the rainfall rate. And we are extremely sensitive to that rainfall rate here in Southeast Texas and Houston with our urban environment. So, you know, we start talking four, five, six inches in an hour, which we get, which we saw with Harvey. That's a huge, huge problem for us. It's not the spread out uh, equal amount of rainfall over a period of time. That was sort of a, a challenge that we I don't think we really realized we were having until after the fact. Uh, after that, people were saying, hey, we thought this was this was 35 inches spread over a week. And it was going to be, you know, we we're going to get a little here, a little here, a little here. And I, we kind of, I think, maybe missed a little bit of the focus on you know, at certain periods of time, we're at 10, 15, 20 inches, 
in a 12 hour period. And we probably could have hit that a little bit harder when we had that forecast confidence of when that was going to happen. Um, of course, there's always the hurricane is going somewhere else, right? But, well, the cone is is Corpus Christi. So why why should I be worried up here in Houston? The, the hurricane's going some down to Corpus Christi. Of course, that's that's just that education part of not understanding the, the impacts far reaching. Of course, we're on the dirty side. Even if this wasn't a big rainfall event, we were going to get impacted regardless um, because of the location where we were with, with respect to the storm. And so, again, that's just kind of an educational impact. The what about this model? We haven't really covered much of that today. Um, model model forecasts are all out there. There were some obviously extreme model forecasts for this event. And there's always going to be some extreme. And that works its way into not only the public thinking and the media sometimes showing it, but also it works its way into the emergency management community. And, you know, sitting in the EOC, people will walk up to you and say, hey, well, the, the European is showing this or the Canadian is showing this. And, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm having to sit there and say, how about we, we, we take the official forecast, we base our decisions on the official forecast, and not so much these deterministic model runs um, that, that people are seeing, because they can, you know, as we all know, they could be out there. And then this was mentioned earlier, and this was a big one. Um, this won't happen. I've lived here all my life. Uh, we've been through everything. Um, th this isn't going to happen. This, you know, we went through Tropical Storm Allison. This can't be worse than Allison. Um, and the fact is, is that when people use prior experience, whatever prior experience they have in that area, uh, the chances of having that exact same storm that you had in 1960 or whatever is, is unlikely. Every storm is going to be unique. Every storm is going to have its own impacts. And we've seen this in other places, not only, you know, with flooding, but also with, you know, Katrina and Mississippi. Oh, I was here for Camille. I'll be fine. And then you had all this, you know, fatalities and storm surge flooding on the Mississippi coast that exceeded Katrina. Saw the same thing with, with Hurricane Ian back in southwest Florida. We were down there doing some work with storm surge. And we heard a lot of the, I, we just couldn't believe it. You know, we went through Charlie and oh, everything was fine. And we just couldn't believe this could happen. I just could never believe um, the water. We get this high. And it's interesting because I did ask one person down there with, with Ian. I said, well, what, what could have, what well, he stayed I said, what could have been said to you or done differently or, or anything that would have changed your mind? And his answer was nothing. He said, I, I fully knew of the, of the warnings. I heard all of that information, but I wasn't going to change my, um, you know, what I was going to do because of any of that. We go to the next slide. Um, and so that was a little bit eye opening. There's, there's going to be some of those um, types of things where you just can't really wrap your head around it. And we've kind of covered that right here, you know, the lack of historical context of rare events. You know, I tell people, all right, we've been through the flooding here. We have some context of, of a big flood with Harvey, but what does 150 mile an hour winds look like? Most of us have never been through 150 mile an hour winds. And so, you know, it's like, oh, if that day comes when we're facing a high end category four hurricane, there's no context of that. There's no context of, you know, the entire area just kind of being uh, level to the ground with the wind. And then you always get into these things with the forecast of can this happen? You know, even us as meteorologists are questioning, you know, something like Harvey, which is so high end and off the scale. Are we really putting out 40, 45, 50 inches of rain? Or are we really going to do that? Um, and, you know, obviously in the end, it, it all worked out. But most people are going to go and they're going to try to verify when they hear these really, I don't know, you kind of call them outlandish forecast, if you will, they're going to go try and verify that with other sources. And so it's really important that your weather enterprise all be on the same, the National Weather Service, your emergency managers, your TV media, other folks that may be posting stuff, we've touched on that a little bit today, are kind of all on the same page. And if everybody, if the, if the public and emergency managers are all kind of hearing the same thing, you know, we might be an inch or less here, or an inch more here. But if they're all kind of hearing the same values and that kind of builds the confidence and the forecast is, is going to work out like, like we think it's going to work out and what we want them to do. What's interesting, and nobody's brought this up yet, and I learned this during um, the winter storm back in 2021, is where does the job of the meteorologist kind of stop? You know, our job is to forecast, explain those forecasts, but then you get into this whole part of impacts. And, and we don't have all of the knowledge for all of the impacts that can happen in a certain 
uh, situation. And for example, the winter storm, the biggest one for us was, yes, we, we knew it was going to be very cold. We knew people were going to have problems with their pipes and stuff like that. But what we did not know was the power situation because we don't have the details of all of the situations you have running the power grid and how you get power and how you generate power. And so never in any of the, the forecasts and the potential impacts was there this, this narrative about large portions of the area losing power. You know, that's that's easy in a hurricane event. We kind of know that. But what is it that that we don't know out there that that we're kind of being asked to communicate? And is it our job? Is it the forecaster's job to cover all of the impacts? Do, does that fall to, you know, um, your local elected officials or does that fall to the emergency managers to know all of the impacts? We give you the forecast and then you put those impacts in there. And I think there's there's kind of a fine line there of what we what we're kind of getting into when we talk about the impacts of certain events. Last slide, and this has already been covered, which is kind of why um, uh, this th we saw this slide earlier. This was this was a big issue for us. Um, like the previous uh, person mentioned, our call to action statements are contradictory <laughs> at this point. You know, for tornado lowest floor interior room, uh, they may have water on the lowest floor, telling them to get to the roof or under flash flood emergency. And so the the decision we made early on in this event was to go with the flooding as a primary threat. Um, so, you know, we talked, the weather service and I, we kind of talked about this a little bit, NWS chat privately, and the weather service folks, you know, it's their mission to warn, but these were your typical tropical tornadoes um, in feeder bands. They lasted five minutes or less, generally weak, and so some of them, they were letting go. They weren't warning on every single one, and we wanted to keep the focus on the flood and flash flood threat. That was, that was the primary uh, situation we were facing with, you know, potential with loss of life and stuff like that, not really the tornado aspect of this. And so it's kind of important to, you know, realize in the event, and sometimes that can be hard to do, um, what is the primary threat right now? Tropical, maybe it's a little bit easier because you have the flooding aspect of it. The tornadoes tend to be weaker, but if you get into a situation where you have, you know, big supercell thunderstorms producing torrential rainfall with the high tornado threat, uh, they could be equal sometimes if the tornado threat is greater. Already your tornado threat is going to tend to be more pronounced with most people than the flood threat. And so we want it in this particular case, we want it to keep that in, in at the forefront is that the, the flooding uh, was the, the more dangerous of the situations versus the tornado. But that may not always be the case. And obviously, you know, we talked about in some cases, the storm surge may be more dangerous than the wind. Uh, or the storm surge may be more dangerous than the inland flood threat. And so it's really putting that primary threat out there and keeping it out there um, and, and making sure that hopefully what is happening, what you're asking people to do is is matching what the, the highest threat is. And that's all I got. I'll turn it back over for the last speaker and questions later. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, excellent discussion. And you raised some very important points that I hope we can dig deeper into uh, throughout the course of the day and the, the workshop. Our final speaker is Jessica Schauer from the National Weather Service Marine Weather Program, and she is also virtual. Yeah, thank you, Marshall. Yes, I, I'm actually the Tropical Services Program Manager for the National Weather Service. We can move on to the next slide. I want to thank the National Academies for inviting me to come talk today. I'll try to get us back uh, on schedule. I know you guys have a very tight ship today. Um, so uh, we want, we're we asked to talk about risk communication and where does it originate like within the National Weather Service? Um, and you can see in the inset there, we have uh, um, coordination happening on the floor at the National Hurricane Center to coordinate key messages um, that go out from the National Hurricane Center, but co are coordinated through multiple parts of the agency. So you can see in the picture, we actually, this is an example of one of the first times that we had uh, what we call the decision support services coordinator. So they're a sort of person who's there to coordinate the messaging across W forecast offices, river forecast centers, um, working with a national water center, working with like Alex at WPC, working with the storm prediction center in Norman um, to try to get those key messages out there um, amplified through NHC's products and then through everybody's products um, downstream so that we can have consistency in the messaging that we're providing. And the, um, the larger part of the slide here, you can see this is an example of our NWS chat 2.0, which is like in a Slack format. 
Um, and this is something that went into effect last year, and it's really been um, a, a great way for us to effectively coordinate on graphics, so graphical men messaging ahead of time, allow us to be a little bit more nimble. Like we try to have like, you know, call to actions and things in our pocket for, for you know, tropical cyclone events, but every storm is different. And that's something that's kind of been a theme today, you know, that we need to be able to be nimble to, to change those things on the fly. And this is a way for us to coordinate that messaging across, across the board. So move on to the next slide, please. And here are some examples of some of the ways that we um, differentiate for our partners what characteristic of the storm is going to pose the greatest risk. So on top, you see the hurricane threats and impacts graphics. And these graphics incorporate probabilistic information in order to provide a reasonable worst case scenario for each of the four hazards that you see there so that um, our emergency managers, partners, and even the public can get a, a look at this to decide, determine what they should be preparing for for the storm. So it's not a deterministic forecast. It incorporates those probabilities. And I know like Rebecca was saying that uncertainty is something, a word that maybe our emergency managers don't always want to hear. And this kind of packages it in a way that, you know, we are incorporating that information. So they're giving you basically what you should be preparing for in this scenario. So you can see there's wind, storm surge, flooding, rain, and tornado graphics for, for this uh, paradigm. And they're, they're issued every time there's watches and warnings in the continental United States. Um, on the bottom, you see examples of some of the uh, standard graphics that are in the um, uh, weather forecast office's standard briefings. We're always emphasizing the hazard that's the most threat for that local area. And on the right, you can see how we look at the hazards you know, relative to each other and providing a, a sense of the confidence the forecaster has in that forecast. You know, so that's uh, we've heard uh, loud and clear, though, that you know, people want more localized information. Those graphics that are, are provided on top there's an interface on every weather forecast office uh, website, every tropical weather forecast office's website that, uh, that can provide that information in a clickable interface um, so that you can drill down to you know, a, a smaller a local level. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways that we're able to provide more localized information, but also keeping into um, account the uncertainty uh, for the storm. So move on to the next slide, please. So we were asked to focus on, um, on three storms, I think primarily because they were rapid intensifiers as, uh, as uh, um, Jason had pointed out. Um, but in Harvey, I know Jeff had spent a, quite a while talking about Harvey, but you know, and Jen Henderson has done a lot of work with the TORFs, the tornado warnings and uh, flash flood overlaps. Um, that is something that we're still struggling with and that we are looking for more information from the social science community and the community at large about how to rectify the, the, the um, call to actions that are conflicting there with, you know, for a tornado trying to go to the lower level of your house, being, you know, in an interior room and with flooding to try to get higher to higher ground. Um, so, and then in Michael, that was a case where we had a large multi-hazard multi damage swath. And, you know, as you can see there, going well into Georgia, um, from that storm. And that's the, a tremendous amount of area that was without power, um, with damage, with trees down, et cetera. Um, and then with Laura, the, one of the main issues that we had to deal with there um, was with the power outages. A lot of people had generators. They were deal, trying to deal with the heat. They had no air conditioning. Um, so the, that was a significant characteristic of Laura that was different from Michael and Harvey. So each one of these storms, even though they were all rapid intensifiers, all had different scenarios, different hazards that were really the, the, the ones to be of major concern for the event. So move on to the next slide. So you can see in looking at the indirect fatality statistics for these storms, it kind of plays out that picture. Um, for Harvey, medical access was a really big issue because the roads were flooded. So even if you had a tornado and you had you know people that were injured because of that, medical access was going to be uh, it was an issue. Um, and then for for Michael, uh, the the recovery after the storm because you had such a large area that was impacted, you had more people who were out there trying to um, you know take down you know tree limbs, cut things up, try to clean up their their you know their area. And you know, that caused big problems. Um, and then with Laura, as you can see, the carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, that was you know, a really a big problem with generators after the storm. And you know, that's something that the weather service did you know, get messaging out about that pretty, pretty early after the storm. But even into October, as we continue to have heat, 
um, in Louisiana, we're still having people, you know, perish from, from carbon monoxide poisoning and from heat. And, uh, and we were sending out, you know, tweets, messages, trying to remind people for of generator safety. So that's one way that we're incorporating, you know, what we've learned, you know, from, from these past events into messaging that we can send out after the event. That the event really isn't over when the weather part of it is over. There's so many, so much more that, that can you know be dangerous to people after these events. So you move on to the next slide. So, and just in general, just looking at the direct and indirect fatalities, one of the big things that um, we uh, are looking for help with, with the weather service is that, you know, the statistics show that they were, we need to target males over 50 because they're the most likely people to die um, with uh, clear preparing for, during, or after the storm. Um, and if there's ways that we can hone our messaging at the, as the event draws near um, to uh, kind of Kind of be able to tailor it towards these things that we can see coming as you know direct or indirect fatalities then i think that that would be you know much more beneficial to the public to be able to adjust our messaging um, and think about that and that's why we have those dss coordinator the decision support coordinator embedded within weather or within nhc to help coordinate that messaging and you know probably something that we need to think about more is how to do that better after the fact so can we move on to the next slide and with that, I'll just say say thank you. And I know that we're running a little behind, so let's we can get to the questions. Thank you. Uh, great, great presentations, very thorough. And I think we do have time for questions. Uh, I have a couple that I want to ask, but I, I want to sort of actually change the game plan a little bit and defer to Hugh. If, if there's anyone in the room that you see that's really itching for a question, I'd like to defer to them. Then I see one hand. Absolutely. So go ahead. I didn't realize you could see me. I, uh, I can see only you. I can't see actually beyond you. I can see you and Brad Coleman. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, Sunny Westcott, Homeland Security says, uh, um, I'm a chief meteorologist over here. And I think one of the biggest problems that I've run into is communicating some of the changes that we've seen with the storm systems, uh, stronger winds, Taiwan reported 212 mile per hour gusts on shore before their sensor broke. Puerto Rico from a tropical storm saw 32 inches of rain and unmarked tropical low, uh, for Fort Lauderdale produced 26 inches of rain. And these aren't systems that typically, like they're not reaching category five. So a lot of people, their response is, well, it's just a tropical storm, so I'm not going to stand up the EOC. Uh, it's the winds aren't that bad, but it's not always wind, as you were saying. And the, Jason, this is probably a little bit more oriented to you as somebody who works on some of these classification problems is I think that there was a huge folly in the initial setup of assigning wind to be the sole indicator of the strength of systems and the concern for evacuation uh, and that we've we've sort of shot ourselves in the foot and backing up and getting some of these emergency evacuations to get people to care about it, to get them to their response is always I've survived a cat four. a tropical storm is nothing. I've spent six years in Florida growing up and my family was the exact same way. They were not going to evacuate. They won't evacuate until the home is destroyed in most cases. And then when they move uh, further inland, they're the only ones evacuating after that and often mocked for doing so. Uh, so I guess my question is, is are we are we looking at changing the way we're categorizing the storm as opposed to changing the way that people perceive the category? Um, I've been a proponent of trying to make changes to classification, but really this comes down to the NHC. They're going to call the shots. And the trick is, do we do we know if changing is going to improve things? Because this one to five scale gets people's attention. It's simple. It's definitely got flaws but people react to a one to five system. And uh, Jessica was just showing that graphic that had all the different hazards and it showed the maps of the different hazards and it showed the uncertainty. I love that, but the average person is only going to process that for 10 to 20 seconds. So how do we get, how do we find a middle ground between the graphic Jessica had that had all the hazards and a one to five scale that has flaws. And that's the trick here because we have to find something that people are going to spend 20 seconds on and get all the information. And that is almost an impossible task, but I will never be satisfied with where we are right now. There's, I guess, some, some implication just to end on that. Going back to the first uh, meeting that we, or the first prisoner that we had, um, the atmospheric rivers that they do the category one through five, but they scale it based off of the area expecting to see the worst impact from the atmospheric river, as opposed to this is a cat five circle 
that's hitting this whole area and everyone needs to, you know, envision it as such, you could essentially take their same scale and fluctuate it based off of impact inland. That, that was, I guess, from what I saw from their graphic to what I see from these graphics. There's a lot of possibilities and people have done that with heat waves. It's been the aerial extent of the heat wave and the magnitude of the heat wave to come up with some type of metric. There's a bunch of different things we can do, but more on that later. <laughs> Do any of our other panelists want to respond to that? Okay. Oh, I, I think Jeff actually, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. Just, um, Sunny, I, I think you definitely summed up that uh, there's a background level of disasters that don't meet the criteria that people might be, see coming like hurricanes, but that are more and more causing those impacts. And I think it reminds me of uh, former administrator Fugate and one of his most successful viral indices isn't anything technical or scientific, but the Waffle House Index, people understand that. They relate to it, especially in Florida. And, you know, we can all joke about it, but is another hurricane classification really going to land when we already have challenges getting people to prepare? We already know that there's evacuation and preparation challenges. Um, how do we translate the impacts of water, regardless of whether it's coming from the sky or the ocean or river or the pipes and drains in asphalt um, that Alex mentioned? How do we translate that to your basement will be wet or you need to pick up and go? And I think that's when we have to not so much just speculate, but really get out there and see from their perspective what lands and um, consider using some of those lessons. So I'm, I'm going to use moderator priv privilege here. I see a couple of questions over on our question format, the slide, Slido. Uh, one is from Castle Williamsburg. Castle asks, in addition to cascading or compounding effects, it's crucial to also evaluate the compounding impacts or effects of our risk communication messaging across our information ecosystem. So how do we begin, begin to assess these consequences too? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer a little bit. I, I think this is something I sort of covered that we went through with the winter storm in 21. Um, you know, when you lose power, the cascading effects of losing power. So eventually you're going to lose cell, you're going to lose backup systems. And, and what we found out was, you know, all these folks who thought their backup systems were in place, they all fail. A lot of them failed because they hadn't tried any backup generation since Hurricane Ike back in 2008. And it's not at the forefront of everybody's mind to try and test their backup systems. Everybody says they do it. Everybody plans to do it every year, but they don't actually do it. And we, we very quickly got into a cascading impact of the power loss, um, losing comms, losing, um, you know, emergency services, uh, losing backup generation, all that type of stuff. And so, you know, I didn't know until 21 that diesel fuel freezes at a certain point, it becomes slushy and the generators don't run on that. And so we actually reached that point when everybody thought their, their diesel fuel generators would be fine and they, they couldn't use them. And so that kind of goes back to my point of, you know, as forecasters, we're forecasting because it's going to be 10 degrees with a 40% chance of freezing rain. You're going to have ice, you're going to have travel impacts, but we don't know all of the impacts that are going to occur. For example, when we lose power um, and, and, and all the, the second and third type of impacts we have. And so I don't, I don't know how we can incorporate that. Obviously, you know, the first thing would be, well, we got to bring more people in, but you're also trying to get the, the products out, right? So you, you're getting the, the warnings and the watches out from the National Weather Service bringing more people in and saying, hey, what's the impact of 10 degrees in Houston, Texas? There's a lot that goes into that. We know now, we, we have some idea now, of course, every event is different. Something's going to happen next time that didn't happen this time. And so I think that's that's important. And the, and the reason I say that is because sometimes people's opinion on how the forecast went is based on the impacts that happened and how they perceive those impacts being. And sometimes we miss the point a little bit on the impact part of it. Yeah, I, I, we're running a little bit short of time, but I'm going to uh, synthesize two questions here. I'm going to sort of summarize them and let uh, maybe a panelist have a quick reaction. One actually was posed by fellow panelist Jen Henderson. Uh, she mentioned that she loved the, Rebecca's question about who owns expertise and accuracy of the forecast and, and Jeff's question about roles. She's curious about how this panel thinks about 
or grapples with the responsibility given multiple hazards and impacts. And then I think Leela has a similar question. Uh, she says, uh, as it Leela or Layla, she says, should the meteorologist be utilized to discuss impacts of things like power outages uh, or should these be discussed by others to maintain the clarity of forecasters' communications role? So I'll wrap up both of those questions and present that to the panel for a response. Yeah, I, I guess, oh, go ahead. Just, I was just going to say, I mean, in power, that's such a great example because um, what we've learned from things like extreme heat, and even to some extent talking about hurricanes, it's really not about the rain itself. We think it is, but the most important question in the room isn't how much rain are we going to get? It's what will that do to my critical infrastructure, my nursing homes, my, you know, the people. And so I am not the expert in that, but the emergency managers I work with are. And so I can hand the baton to them and working as a team because we're integrated and I work, I literally sit next to them every day and collaborate. And even with the hurricane center, we see each other constantly. Um, I can hand the baton when needed. So I don't have to, you know, put their hat on. And that's everybody. what I was going to say too, that it's a community, like, and it has to be that way because everybody has their different expertise and the you know impacts are local. It's what's going to happen to me and my location to my business. And, and in order for, we can't all be expertise experts at all of that. There has to be, you know, different people that we turn to and have good constant communication, like Rebecca pointed out, that they have with emergency managers, as well as with the National Hurricane Center and National Weather Service. And I see that Amanda Schroeder mentioned that there is some ongoing work in the National Weather Service. I know Amanda is a panelist a little bit later, uh, so she'll be talking a bit more about that. But I want to thank our panelists. This was an outstanding session. I, I knew it would be when we were thinking about who we wanted in this panel. So thank you all for accepting our invitation and the charge. And uh, I believe we are going to transition into a break right now, and then we'll return with a high-level summary. I will disappear for uh, about an hour or so, and so I will see you all a little bit later. Thank you all, and I think we're in our next break. <laughs>